Next up is Voices of Change with your hosts, Leslie Acosta and Isa Richardson. Voices of Change is to connect, inform, and empower people to engage in social political change. Right here on Usula Radio. World news, local politics, saving money and investing, all this and more, right here on Usula Radio. Your voice, your radio. Radio uh, with your host Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. Today we have uh, we have two guests. Hopefully, we're waiting for another one, David Rodriguez, who's on his way uh, to join us. But I want would like to introduce uh, two candidates that are running in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. One is running for state senate in the 13th uh, district, and the other is running for a uh, auditor general in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Nina Ahmed is a candidate for the Office of Auditor General in Pennsylvania. Nina served for nearly half a decade as president of the Philadelphia Chapter National Organization for Women, which is called NOW. Uh, most recently, Nina served as deputy mayor for public engagement under Mayor Kenny. Nina also served uh, for uh, President uh, Barack Obama, and uh, she, um, she as as, uh, as a member of the National Advisory Co uh, Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific I uh, Islanders, advising on key issues affecting the health, employment, and well being of these communities. If elected, Nina would represent the first woman of color to serve as a statewide executive in the Commonwealth, 233 years of history. Dr. Ahmed will also become the only current woman and person of color in Pennsylvania's executive offices. Uh, Nina earned a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in chemistry and completed a medical fellowship at Thomas Gen uh, Jefferson University. Uh, Janet is a candidate for state Senate in the district uh, in District 13. Uh, she launched her campaign in 2017 for Lancaster City Council. Diaz won her race for city council and has proudly been serving as an independent voice on city council for the entire city while becoming the first unendorsed uh, Latina to win the number one slot on city council. She was also recognized as one of the top 100 historical vote getters and featured on the Huffington Post. Diaz is currently a member of the PA Dems Latino Caucus. Uh, she also serves on Naleo Education Fund, the Democratic Federation of Women, Farmers Union, Lancaster African, African American Historical Society and the Pennsylvania Municipal League. And so welcome women and uh, women and thank you for, for being here. And I'm so proud uh, that we see women of color running in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, uh, before, you know, we, we get into this conversation of why you guys elected to run for these seats. Um, I wanna start with, uh, with Ms. Ahmed, uh, Nina, and I know you've, you, you have experience running for public office. You ran for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, you also had a bid for the congressional seat. Uh, now uh, you are running for the AG uh, seat, state, uh, uh, state seat here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, what has been your motivating factor uh, to get involved in politics, especially as a female. As you know, the climate for running for political office for females can become very complicated because it's dominated by men. What has been your motivating factor in doing this? So my hashtag is leave no one behind. And that is the operating principle. And it comes from my own uh, lived experience. As a child, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country. As a child, I lived through a war of independence that created the country of Bangladesh. And in that nine month war, um, I watched 3 million people killed and 200,000 women and girls brutalized as a tool of war. Taught me two things, that people will make the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. And two, women are second class citizens. We get to be used in all these manners. So, um, with that frame, I've always uh, made sure I'm an advocate, not just for myself, but those who are marginalized, whether it be women or any other group. And having a voice 
is really what democracy is about. And that is what has been driving me. I've come to this country where I recognize um, all of you on this call have had to struggle. Uh, your uh, four mothers and forefathers have had to struggle. I couldn't be here unless I stand in that sacrifice and remember that. Uh, so it is really for me uh, paying it forward that I was able to come to this country, get an education, um, get a great education, and then be able to do all these all these other things that I've done in my life. I want to make sure everybody has that opportunity, particularly you know we've got generations of people living here, uh, and they don't have they, they haven't had those doors open. So I deeply uh, am you know, always remembering that I stand in the struggle of other people and solidarity is important. So that is why I'm running to make sure I bring the skill set to open doors and make sure our tax dollars are used to reach everybody. So there's equity in how, um, how we spread our resources. And COVID-19 is showing that what we knew already that it, it, it is not spread equitably. Yeah, so that's absolutely. Yeah, I'm gonna, I have, I'm gonna do a follow-up question, but I'm gonna introduce Janet. Um, Janet, you are the uh, actually the first Latina running in the state Senate seat. Uh, proud to, to uh, know that you are doing this. Uh, I know that there's some challenges uh, and some complications to this uh, because of the makeup of the, of the district. However, we know um, in the sections of, uh, in that sections of Allentown, Hazleton, Bethlehem, Reading, uh, we see an increase of the Latino population in those areas. Um, you are now running, you, you, you sit, you, you're currently elected into a city council seat and you won that seat um, as an independent. You were not endorsed. Uh, people were not behind your candidacy. And now you're running for the state Senate seat. Tell me, uh, you know, how uh, and what motivated you uh, to run for this seat? And, and what really are your chances, uh, given the increase of the Latino population in that area, to win that seat? Well, I would say that it is a challenge. Although after a year of campaigning and speaking to the constituents, I realized that it has nothing to do with getting endorsed. And I think I showed that the first time. It's communicating with the constituents, finding out what's wrong and what is exactly you need to do as a representative of those constituents in the state. First of all, people don't realize how many, not only Latinos, but also Anglos in the outskirts in the suburb area of Lancaster County that don't have health care. They are living paycheck to paycheck. Some are, well, especially now that the coronavirus, they're unemployed. They're not, they're not getting the assistance that they need to go out there and make sure they're tested. Some of them, especially those that are Hispanic in the Lancaster city, and even outside, because there are some Latinos that have moved into the uh, suburb area because it's a lot less expensive. They don't understand the process because they don't have health care. They, they their mentality is, if I go, they're going to charge me, and I don't have the money for that. That's another reason that I took the role to say, all right, it's time for me to step up and make sure that I represent not only the Latinos, but everyone. Now, in reference to the amount of uh, percentages of Latinos that are in Lancaster, it's about a total of 38,000. 28,000 of them live in poverty. Mm. And it's not because they don't want work, it's because they're not hired, just like it happened to my mother when she was looking for work. She wasn't hired, so she had to wind up in the system. So the, the makeup of them going out to vote, I think, it's so important for the Latinos to go out and vote, especially now with the presidential election. I feel that being a candidate of not only a woman, a woman of color, and also of Latina would get them more motivated to come out and vote because I feel it's crucial for them to come out and vote. Yeah, uh, we, we, were, we are just joined by David Rodriguez. Uh, David is the chairman of the Latino Caucus for the State Democratic Committee. The caucus focuses on voter registration and informing the Latino community on how important it is to vote. Um, the caucus uh, is con has concentrated most of its efforts in Philadelphia, Allentown, Bethlehem, Reading, Lancaster, and Lebanon. 
David, welcome and thank you for uh, yeah. making the connect with Janet and with Nina to have this important conversation of women of color running for public office. So welcome, David. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for the opportunity to participate, to share with your audience. Yeah. Uh, so Aisha, Aisha, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to um, follow up to what Janet was saying earlier before we went on the air about um, the need to do education as she is going out and talking to voters. And so I wanted to ask David a little bit about the education campaigns that the uh, Latino caucus is doing and particularly about the mail-ins, uh, mail-in ballots, because we know our election, our primary election has been pushed back to June 2nd. And in Philadelphia, the mail-in ballots are going to have pre-postage, the postage is going to be paid. And so how are we going to make sure that folks who maybe are low income across other areas of the state can get those ballots back into the uh, into where they, they need to go? Well, that's a issue that, that we are uh, having to be in. It's unfortunately that uh, COVID-19 has taken us that way because there's a lot of people, they're not uh, comfortable with going to vote in person. So mm -hmm. what we're doing with the caucus is whoever uh, our candidates are and are myself and other people will provide postage to those individuals who wants to send in uh, their ballot by mail. Great, and so are there any campaigns that are happening to be able to do go, get out the vote um, activities, particularly in Spanish and people's languages, so that they feel that they know that they're a more educated voter? Well, we, every time that we have an election, we put out there in the forefront in Spanish and in different areas, we have our contacts that will be out there in Spanish, uh, educating the people, making sure that the people uh, won't have that language barrier and uh, informing them in Spanish about uh, the elections coming up. Great, yeah. great. Okay, uh, Nina uh, and for Janet, I have a follow-up question. Let's talk a little bit about your political platform. Uh, if elected, tell us uh, how, especially Nina, you have a very, it's a, you know, in the position as AG for the state, that's a very, that's really protecting taxpayer dollars. Uh, Eugene has done an excellent job in identifying a lot of things and uncovering a lot of things that, ha that has been wrong across this Commonwealth. Um, from the educational money that's going to the school district here in Philadelphia, a lot of things have been reported there. Um, you know, he has rooted out uh, or he has highlighted a lot of corruption, if you will, um, in, 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 those, in those audits. What is your political platform? And how would you piggyback on what Eugene has done for the state um, and is leaving a trajectory of success um, here in the state of, of his efforts in, in really uh, highlighting, locating, um, and, and, and uprooting uh, the misuse of funds, if you will, um, in, 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 in taxpayers' money? How, how, what, would you, what would you do in that, in that position and talk to us a little bit about your political platform? Absolutely. I um, will be actually walking in that legacy, holding up that legacy, and building out that legacy of our current Auditor General, Eugene De Pasquale. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, he has done a great job of highlighting where we have seen our tax dollars not being used with integrity. That's the first job, to make sure we're doing it efficiently, effectively, with accountability transparency. I want to add another E, equity, because mm -hmm. What happens is we are looking at a distribution of these dollars um, you know, through our budget process. Um, what I want to put a, is a lens on it to say, not only do we have to make sure it's done with integrity, but I want to see where are they going and what is the performance of them. Um, across 67 counties, uh, different counties have different needs and how is that being reflected in our budgetary process and then report back to the people. So two things I want to do. One is set up a really solid relationship with the legislators and the rest of the executive branch so that the data we collect in this office actually goes to inform what they 
they are doing. Um, I've already been talking to legislators who uh, know about the office, but really haven't engaged to say, how can we use that information to have better policy? This whole office, all our all public service is about doing public good. And how do we do public good in, in any different role we have is the driving principle here. So that's one. And I actually believe that with data and political leadership, we can support public policy that takes care of our most vulnerable. And I believe that that is not only a compassionate, but it's actually cost effective. And that to me is a democratic value. I'm a deep blue Democrat and that's my political platform. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things there's, and I'll say this, Nina, uh, there's a lot of waste. There's a yes. lot of waste when it comes to taxpayers' money here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You know, we talk about, Republicans talk about being fisc fisc fiscally responsible, mm -hmm. and yet we see a lot of waste. Um, and, and, you know, so we, 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 have to, we have to make sure that we are protecting taxpayers' uh, money here. And, and uh, you know, given your experience also as a business owner, because you're yes. also a business owner, so you know how to pump resources uh, back into the community, uh, you know, ha ha how to manage. And that's important to have, to be able to have that skill set. Um, not only have the political acumen, but also have the business acumen to be able to manage things correctly. I want to give one quick example, if I could, of how uh, one of my big platform issues is healthcare and making healthcare affordable. And one of the big drivers of healthcare costs is prescription costs. Yeah. And uh, I am looking very closely at um, something that our current Auditor General has started is the uh, prescri a pharmacy, pres uh, pharmacy benefits manager. The pharmacy benefits manager is um, a role in the supply chain of how you get your medicine from the pharmaceutical company to you, the patient, at the end of the day. They were, they were put in place to actually make efficiencies for, um, for our, uh, the customer by making sure efficiencies are, are, are shared with the pharmacies, the independent pharmacies that actually do the uh, getting the, uh, uh, the drugs and selling it to you. But there is no transparency there. You don't know how what the deal is with the pharmaceutical company, how much the rebate is being passed through. Uh, and so uh, already legislature is looking at that. It's a bipartisan bill on the floor to make that more transparent. And what I'll tell you, it's in, in 2017, $2.84 billion were paid for, Medi uh, for Medicaid recipients to the pharmacy benefits managers. In the nation, it's a $15 billion industry. Uh, oh. so with no transparency there, my physician friends have told me the formulary where the drugs, you know, where you choose the drugs from, they don't have oversight over that. Non-medical personnel, the pharmacy benefits managers do. And then this job is a devil in the details. Mm. What happens is the reason why we have lack of oversight is because we can, Auditor General can only look at uh, audit co direct contractors to the state. Pharmacy benefits manager is a subcontractor. Ah, that's the so that's, that's yeah. a big that's a big issue. So every time it's really the Auditor General's office is looking at systems, mm -hmm. making sure that our tax dollars are not only used with integrity, but what is the goal of spending them? So you know, all of us here are uh, people who uh, have you know come from a culture that is not the dominant culture in the country, right? We have um, many of us have different languages. One of the big things to serve people is to have language access. I want to actually assess when I look at audits um, that what are the components of making sure the audit reads the target audience? Are, what, how friendly are those um, procedures, which includes language access, which includes making sure you are aware of what community you're in, interacting with? What is the representation of people serving who have those lived experiences. So this is an opportunity to really look at state government mm -hmm. and really look to see how we dismantle barriers of racism. Right. I, how I look at it. Uh, Aisha, do you have any questions for Nina? No, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, the I think I wanna pose both questions to Janet and to Nina and, and that is, um, and, and you answered, you know, Nina, a little bit about the function of the Auditor General's office, because I think that so many folks across uh, the, the electorate, they don't know the difference between their city council person, 
and their <laughs> state representative and their state <laughs> senator and their U.S. senator and their U.S. congressman. So, so if you could talk, um, maybe I, Janet, you know, you could talk a little bit about what is the function of the state senator? And then Nina, what is the function of the Auditor General's office? Okay. Well, just in, in reference to like, for example, healthcare, we know that we have the ability to cap medication and the, we have the access to do it. So that's one of the reasons I wanna target. I've worked in health insurance. I work at the hospital and I was also a billing manager at a physician's office. So I do have all the backgrounds and reference on how processing claims and how important it is for us to make sure that Pennsylvania do the contractual negotiations with these companies. I mean, we, we have not only healthcare that we can tackle, we also have school education um, funding, which has to do with not only private, but also the local um, colleges that we have. And also we have um, the trade schools. We, we do ne ne need to take care of the 12K high, uh, high schools and elementary schools. So those are some of the things. Farming, I'm, I'm very passionate about farming. I lived three years in a farm in Puerto Rico. So I know how, how hard it is in Pennsylvania, currently, especially now where food is just being thrown out how we need to tackle those issues. We have the highways, the infrastructure, you know, I mean, compared to city council, city council is just, yeah, we, we need to work on raising taxes for the city and for the counties. And, and we do need to make sure that we take care of sewer and water and uh, making sure that we have clean water coming into homes and the flooding issues that we have. So, you know, removal of trash and, and it's totally a different thing. They, they tackle certain certain things in the city, but in the state, it's a little broader. I mean, we have the opportunity to make changes uh, across the board, but we have to work, of course, with the federal government to make sure that we get the, the proper funding. And, you know, we have um, the, the taxes, like let's say taxes for gaming and, um, you know, the, you know, wine and spirit, you know, all these things that we, we work on the, on the state level, let's say, um, de you know, let's say in reference to decriminalization of marijuana or, you know, the justice system. So those are things that the state have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. And I mean, it's a lot broader than the city. It is a big chunk, but obviously every legislature, every, every um, representative takes two or three things to chair, just like I chair right now, the finance and I also chair personnel and um, water works, you know, public works. So it's a big, a big entity. And um, so my, my goal in getting into the state is obviously healthcare. That's where my strong, um, my knowledge and my strength is. Um, extending mental health. I know we can work and, ex and, and making sure that our patients are treated fairly, not just a week, but if they need more continual treatment, that they continually get the treatment until they're completely healed. Um, capping the medication. We were, I was talking with Senator Haywood. I've already started the platform on getting the healthcare started in reference to making sure that we have one umbrella where all businesses and their small employees that are in those small businesses are participating. So more like a public type of healthcare. And, you know, it goes on in reference to healthcare. I wanna make sure we, we raise the minimum wage. So people like, African Americans and, and Latinos are having enough wages to all, to be able to afford health care because they don't have it. I mean, Lancaster County alone has twenty two thousand children without health care. Wow. Why? You know, that is a lot. And and then when I ran into people in, in the suburb area like Millersville and, and and over in Strasburg, some of them don't have health care at all because it, the Obamacare was just way too much for them. I mean, they have 960 pages. Do you think they can, they have the understanding to read all the policies that that particularly holds for health care? It's impossible for them to understand that. So I hope I answered your question. I kind of went a little bit over to one side. Nina? 
Yeah, so as I said, um, I will be the chief fiscal watchdog of the state, meaning I'll check, make sure your tax dollars are used with integrity. What does that mean? How do you do it? You do it by doing financial audits or performance audits. And we, um, the staff, uh, which has CPAs, and then under them are uh, bureau chiefs and then auditors one, two, and three, and those are the unionized jobs. There used to be 800 people, it's down to 392 or something around there, which is a real decimation doing the same 5,000 plus audits. So that's a real issue there. And I asked actually people who stood up to ask to make sure we advocate to have that department properly uh, resourced. So that's, a, that's an issue I have to address. Um, but going back to what it does, when you do these financial audits or, and performance audits, you then issue a report. It's a, a set of recommendations that is put out to the agency that you uh, audited, as well as to the public and to you know, our legislature and to our government in general. My goal is to say, not only is it to put out a recommendation, but how do you make that rec rec uh, recommendation actionable? And that comes from relationship building, that comes from actually designing audits in a way that really reflect the needs of the people. Right now, I'm a biomedical scientist. We had this COVID pandemic. Our federal government has failed us in their response. It's up to the states. Our governor and our secretary of health, Dr. Levine, have done an enormous job, a great job. But we need to have a pandemic a preparedness audit that is proactive, that goes to check every agency that would interact in terms of responding to a pandemic. We're gonna have more pandemics because the world has become smaller. We're engaging with more people. We're gonna be spreading disease at a much higher clip. In our, and we already knew that President Obama had a pandemic unit set up in the CDC. We need to have that level of awareness at the state level to make sure we know who are the agency who need to be mobilized, what are the resources that need to be in stock, what are the resources that need to be replenished over time. There's a myriad of things we need to be doing. That's one of the first things I want to do is a pandemic awareness audit, a preparedness audit, and make sure there's input from communities, including the ex experts, the public health officials, the economic advisors. We also need people who experienced it, patients who went through it, to come up with a sustainable preparedness plan. So that's an example of what an Auditor General can do to get our state ready proactively. Because most of these audits are after the fact. You go in, you do the audit, and you issue a report. I want to do some proactive work where we actually tell the people what is going on in your state uh, with respect, uh, for example, to healthcare, but schools, you know, uh, I can go on and on. The three things that I'm working on, healthcare, education, and violence. And the vi violence is uh, all the way from sexual violence to gun violence and how the Auditor General's office can be involved with that. I have a follow-up question, Nina, in regards to the um, healthcare. Here in the city of Philadelphia, we have a one system shop which is the community behavioral health system that is the managed care for for uh, <laughs> our health industry here in the city of Philadelphia. It is completely monopolized uh, here in the city, especially when it comes to providing services to the Latino community health care here in the city. We have, I would say, probably uh, you know Latino patients over 50,000 be in service through this managed care agency, CBH, CBH, here in the city of Philadelphia. And I don't, you know, I don't know what role you might play if elected. Um, you know, I think that that is a system that needs to be looked at. Absolutely. It's a system that doesn't play fair uh, when it comes to the Latino community and to service in the Latino community. Um, and how would you how, how would you look at that system uh, to create a balance across the board? Yeah. Um, because it's the only system we have in town, and it's the only managed care, and it's monopolized completely, where no one can play in, only but CBH, and they dictate what ser who receives those services and how. How yeah. would you how would you uh, what would be your role in that? So um, I have already. Um, had conversations with Rebecca Reinhardt, who's actually looking at the de Department of Behavioral Health uh, mm -hmm. and Intellectual Disabilities. Those, that is the agency that actually contracts with 
uh, community behavioral health do mm -hmm. actually. Uh, that's a huge, one of the largest bu uh, budgets in the city is that department. Yes. Okay. So uh, working, you have to work with the local controllers on the ground, um, and that would be Re Rebecca mm -hmm. in this um, um, uh, case, as well as other people in other places. And you know, pig piggyback that audit the same way that looking at parking authority for resources for education that are supposed to come. Mm -hmm. Similarly, looking at the healthcare, uh, how she has been able to break down to see um, the, what is the monopoly doing? Is that monopoly actually being healthy for yes. the services or is it not? Because this is a data oriented job. So you, you can say, here's the information. This is what we have, and this is who had served, and this is the outcome we're getting. Outcome is really important to assess. And I believe that she's actually setting up a system where she's doing that, and I want to use all of that information to kind of build out a bigger platform across the state about how are we looking at outcomes to determine how the resources are going and who the resources are going to. Uh, that is very going to be very critical that that's where the corruption piece plays in yes. and the play to uh, play, pay to play issues come in. You know, this is an this is an office that actually looks to get transparency and accountability. When you match those two outcome transparency and accountability, you're going to have a much fairer system. Absolutely. Board. So that's I'm very interested in that. Yeah, I think and I think it's important that you're hitting you're hitting the nail on the head. How do you look at these systems? Yes. And then find out where these, if these systems are playing fair across the board. And that's, I mean, if, if, if I tell you, Nina, if you're able to do something like that, I think you're going to be able to bring transfer, transparency to that office. And I think it's going to be, it's, we're going to be able to play fair, which right now that is not, that is not currently happening, especially for the Latino uh, uh, folks that, uh, that are being serviced currently under the CBH umbrella. Uh, we have to take a short break. We'll be right back. Uh, David, stay with us because we have a question in regards to uh, your efforts um, across these counties to get more Latinos involved in the political process, especially women. Um, and so we'll be right back. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host, Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. Emergency plan today. Welcome so, back. Nina, you are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio. We have three guests here today on Voices of Change. We have David Rodriguez, uh, the chairman of the Latino Caucus in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the Democratic Party. We also have Nina Ahmed, who is running for the AG uh, seat uh, for Pennsylvania. And we also have Janet Diaz, who's running for the state Senate seat uh, 13th uh, 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 district. And so, Aisha, go ahead. I, I know you had a few questions. Go I ahead. do. I do. Um, so the, this issue around uh, COVID-19 
And um, the health disparities is something that I'm very concerned about. And I know that the Lieutenant Governor just um, convened a a, a, a task force on COVID-19 and health disparities in uh, communities of color. So um, the one thing that I am concerned about, though, is what you talked about, which is outcomes, right? So it's one thing to look at an issue. It's another thing to make it um, interdepartmental, right? So if you have those interdepartmental voices, then you have the outcome piece, right? So I, I'm hoping that this um, this task force that just was recently created about a week or so ago will be able to be um, interdepartmental so that folks from the Auditor General's office can look at the things that um, Leslie was talking about in terms of how services are distributed, particularly in, in low income and in communities of color. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more uh, that what who you put on a task force is critical. Um, for example, the governor had done a task force around maternal mortality, um, just as an ex example, because that's a big issue for uh, communities of women of color, particularly mm -hmm. women. Right? When I looked at that makeup of the a task force. It was great. It had a lot of people, but it was missing doulas. It was mm. missing at birth advocates who actually can make a difference in the outcome of that pregnancy. So those are the kinds of things I will be looking at to say, hey, you know, you're putting this together, great idea. Did you think about the breadth of who needs to be at that table in mm -hmm. order to be effective in whatever recommendations you're gonna come up with, or also even what areas you're gonna look at. If you don't have a doula at the table, you will not actually know uh, what the issues a pregnant woman is facing right in that labor and delivery room, right? And um, one of the biggest things we have found in uh, maternal mortality, for example, it is not socioeconomic, it is not anything, education, nothing, it's race. Because mm -hmm because our health system is not particularly physicians are not listening to black women when they're telling you this is what is wrong with me that's the first thing you have to do as a physician is to listen to listening and listening to your patient is the biggest uh, roadmap for you when you don't have that happening you have those outcomes similarly in the covid pandemic uh, issue you're going to have to have people who did not get tested and tell you what those barriers were Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't just have public health officials there. You have to have labor union folks whose jobs were, who were the frontline people who got impacted by that. If you don't mm -hmm. have them at the table, then you can't go have good policy that would include them too. This is why representation is so important because mm -hmm. you bring these lived experiences and that shapes the best public policy. That's why diversity is important. That's why inclusion is important. Not, in it, not just because that is how the world looks, but it's actually how your tax dollars are used. So right. I am going to be looking very carefully at the makeup of who makes those decisions about our tax dollars going in certain places. Yeah, yeah and I'd like to also say something, uh, payback on that, um, especially here in Lancaster. I remember listening um, last Tuesday where Dr. Ruchinski had a conference and he mentioned that 25% of Latinos have been infected. So when you hear that is affecting that amount of people in Lancaster, it makes you very disconcerting on how much data is actually being put out there because another person who is the commissioner, uh, Craig Lehman, had a meeting with uh, the, the, the Democratic Party and I was actually listening at that time. And he mentioned that it was 6%. And I'm like, we're getting data and conflicting data. The good thing is that since I do work at the hospital, I'm getting the right information. My boss is like, hey, Janet, I want you to get online right away, listen to the conference so you can listen to see what's going on with the Latino community. You know, I work in the neurology department, but still, you know, she is, she knows that I'm running and she knows how passionate I am about making sure that our Latino community know that if they need that help to go out and get tested before it was at the point where people were not getting tested because 
they thought that they would get charged. And if they didn't have health care, they were not going to get uh, the testing done. So, you know, we went out there and I and I started posting out there, look, if you are Latino and you feel you're getting signs and sick, you know, you're getting that fever, you got that cough, get out there, get tested, you will not be charged. And you make sure that when you get up there and you're going to be the next person to be tested, you tell them, I do not have health care. I cannot afford this test, but I am here because I know that I'm going to get this done without having to pay and make sure that we protect the community as a whole. Most of these Latinos and also uh, people of color and low income people in general, they're not getting tested. And a lot of them are the frontline workers, the ones that are stacking those groceries um, in those um, stores, the ones that are delivering, you know, the, the restaurant cooks that are still working, the frontline people that are in the hospital that are cleaning um, and the housekeeping. I mean, think I, I know I have a few of my friends that work there and I and I check up on them to how how is it? He goes, well, we're really busy. You know, we got to suit up. We got to make sure we clean everything. And I'm like, well, you know what? Thank you, because it's important to know that you you are the ones that are got, you know, you basically have to get into rooms where you have to clean up blood or you have to no matter what the droplets are, you know, you're the frontline people. These are the people that are getting infected, the doctors, the nurses. So we need data that is real data. I'm going to say that I'm going to be a little biased, but I'm going to go with the data that the Lancaster General is giving and Dr. Ruchinsky is giving because they're the ones that are there. They're the ones that are getting the patients. And, you know, they're the ones that are getting the data from and the benchmark that's that's being um you know, given out there. So that's so important that that as, as a community, we get the right data to know what, where are the communities that we really need to make sure they understand in their language, because Lancaster is very known about the, you know, the population of immigrants as well. So, you know, I just wanted to, to just chime in and just let you know that we're having the same issue here in Lancaster. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, we know we we know is that government can't do it all. So um, there there has been a coalition of black doctors that have been going out and doing testing, and it and it came as a result of a pastor um, in Jenkintown, um, Salem Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. My concern is that they while they are hitting the black community, they're not hitting the Latino community. And so I would I would um, I'd be really um, honored to be able to make some connections between some of the black doctors and some folks in the Latino community so that we can get the, that testing done. And there, there will be people who can speak Spanish to be able to do that. So um, David, um, I'll connect with you, Janet, I can connect with you mm-hmm. about trying to figuring out how we can <laughs> get those folks, get, get folks who are folks of concern connected to each other. Yeah, and that's important. You know, David, uh, as the chairman of the Latino caucus, we, we also have to be at the forefront of that, right? Exactly. You know, there's certain communities that are being tested and yet the Latinos are behind. Uh, when it comes to that, there has to be a voice here um, of how and, and who can do those connections uh, because we're always behind. Um, and I just, I, all I have to say about that is, you know, the lack of a vision and leadership that we have within our own Latino community it, it becomes a huge problem for us, David. You know this, and I know this. We've been, we've been having this struggle for a long time. Yes, uh, it's, it's unfortunately that that in our community uh, we are always uh, like a couple steps behind, and there's a lot of people that we should be working together. When it comes down to uh, having a disease like this, like the COVID nineteen, I believe in working with everybody. I don't believe I know that. People be like, well, I don't get along. This is not about getting along. This is about surviving. Because if we don't get a hold of this disease, which is getting better now. I wouldn't say we are we are any clear, but it is getting a little better. Uh, we have to tackle it as everybody as Americans. Uh, it doesn't happen that way, but as part of the Latino community. We have to be in, in the front lines. We have to be pushing the issue, but we're pushing the issue to have more tests done. Uh, there is more tests done uh, in here in, in Philadelphia, but it's still not everybody's getting tested the way they're supposed to be tested. And I think this is something that we could do uh, statewide and Aisha. And if you have these doctors and uh, we could do something and, and 
make a, a, a coalition, maybe statewide or something that we could help more people get tested. I'm, I'm down for it. Yes, I want to participate in something like that. Great. So I'll, I'll connect with you about, um, you know, who are the folks that we should be talking to, whether it's Maria de los Santos or whether it's uh, Esperanza Health Center. We, we really do need to make sure that those folks who are doing work in the Afri in the uh, Latino community are connected with each other because, um, because it, you know, it's our people that are dying. Right. Yes, so we have yes, to make sure. sure that we, you know, that we, um, you know, if nobody else is going to do it, if government is, isn't going to do it, then we have to step up and do it ourselves. Yeah. Yes, and, I, and, and I also want to say that I have known some people already, personally, from people that I know from my neighborhood that already have passed away because of the COVID-19. So it, it's striking home, people. It's real. And we have to be more aggressive and we have to participate in it as far as getting more tests done. Yeah. Right. Nina, before, uh, I, you know, we, we're about to conclude in, in a few minutes, but I want you to do your last pitch. I just want to say I am, I am proud, Nina, that you're running, Janet, that you're running for public office. Um, and I tell you what, I, Nina, since the day that I met you, that you were running for that congressional seat, uh, your passion is real. Uh, this is authentic, folks. People that are listening and viewing this uh, show today, Nina and Jen, this is real people on the front line wanting to make some real changes at our state government and also across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You can't get any real than this. And so I want you to make your last pitch here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, uh, I'm, I'm proud of what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing and people and women of color running for public office. Nina, uh, tell us, what do you want us to know before you go? Well, first of all, thank you. That, that uh, the fact that you uh, recognize and you're talking about authenticity, that is, that is the most important thing you can bring to the table. Who are you? What are your values? What, what is guiding you to do the work public service that you'll do? So as I said before, Government is there to do public good, and that is exactly the mantle I want to take on in this office. We all have different roles. The Auditor General, along with being your fiscal watchdog, making sure your tax dollars are used with integrity, I believe the data in that office can really go to inform uh, state legislators like Janet here and all of us who are doing public good. So that's the first order of business, is to not only keep your dollars safe and used efficiently, follow the money, Make sure that uh, it's used equitably. And this is the feedback you give to your legislators when they're shaping the budget to say, this audit happened, this is what we found. Make sure, and this community is not being targeted. So I believe that if we bring that kind of a lens, we can improve the systems that operate that serve the public. I'm looking at healthcare, I am looking at education, and I'm looking at violence. These, unless we live, we can't actually enjoy our education. So these are fundamental basic issues. I'm someone, as you said, who's authentic. I remember standing in front of a Burger King when I got to this country deciding whether I can add mushrooms to my hamburger. Mm. Those number of cents made a difference to my very limited budget. Mm -hmm. I remember having a coat with a lining that was totally ripped. And so I didn't have resources to fix it. So when you were having someone held your coat, I said, no, thank you. It's fine. Because I had to thread my arm in a certain way to avoid getting my hand in, in that pocket there. Mm -hmm. So and those have never left me and the kindness of people along the way to allow me today to run for this office, a statewide office. I don't take that journey lightly. I didn't get here by myself. And I want to make sure people understand I will never forget who makes this country run. It is our low income women at wages that are, uh, you know, not uh, life sustaining. They're doing three jobs, taking care of their family, and then we want them to vote, right? To take the time to learn about all this. So it is our job with the people who actually have the resources to get them their information, good information that they can make their decisions. So I implore everyone uh, who can, you know, who can go online to get their mail-in ballot application and then get the ballot 
and use that. That is going to be the healthiest way to do your vote. And then if you're not able to go online because the digital divide is real, there are people who have no access to broadband, please call your county office and it will be sent to you, right? So our job is going to be, my job is going to be messaging. I have built a broad coalition, which includes organized labor, uh, you know, community groups, women's groups, students, uh, immigrant groups. I just got, I was endorsed by the second gen pack and I had a call with them yesterday about what can we do for our immigrant communities that are here and driving the economy? All of those things, all of those people, I implore you to use your right to vote because people died for you and me to have this vote. So use your power, and every one of us have power, get your ballot, and hopefully you will consider voting for me for your next Auditor General of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Ex excellent um, uh, you know, rendition of who you are, what your vision is, and what that platform, and how you're going to take that if elected uh, statewide. Uh, Janet, uh, what you know to conclude? I'm also proud of, of uh, you taking this step. I know it hasn't, it wasn't easy uh, even to convince you to take this this jump uh, for the state senate, but you're doing it, and, and I'm proud of you. And 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 I know that 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 you can do this. So tell us, you know, how, what is you, what what do you want to tell us before we we conclude? Well, first of all, I want you to exercise your right to vote. That is the number one thing. Um, the reason I'm running, I want you to realize that is the same issues that everyone across the Pennsylvania and probably all across the, the United States is health care. I will fight for you to make sure you have the good quality health care that you deserve. Why? Because you are a worker that pay taxes and you deserve it. Health care, along with capping medications, you cannot afford insulin because it's over $1,000 a month or Plavax or Eliquis because it's just out of, out of your range, which means you have to make a decision whether you're going to buy food or whether you're going to pay your rent or mortgage. And that is enough is enough. We need to continue making sure, especially now with this COVID-19, we have a lot of people suffering of mental health. There are people that need to get out of their houses but are becoming so depressed that they don't even go out to take a walk. We need to extend that mental health, especially crucial now more than ever. We also want to fight for for making sure that we have our farmers that have the resources to continue their farms. We don't want to lose any more farm. We already export 938 billion in 2017. We want to continue. We need our food resources here more than ever. We're not being able to get anything from other countries. I think United States of America need Americans to continue fighting and growing crops and opening factories so we can have good jobs here, that we can make products here, that we don't have to worry about getting products from other countries that may have poison or may not be um, may not be real food, could be plastic rice that I've seen online. We have to continue fighting for education, making sure it's equitable, hitting those areas in the suburbs that don't have the, the resources to buy computers for their students or even the city kids that are living, that are, you know, going, they're working, they're basically going to schools where it's infected with lead. We need new schools for these city kids. We, we have to continually realize that I am here to fight for you. I am the person that knows how you feel because I am a worker as well. I pay taxes just like you do. I've heard you when I've knocked on doors. I've received hugs from, from people that I don't even know. I even had a Republican say, I would consider voting for you because you listen to me. <laughs> I'm listening and I heard you. I am here for you. And we are gonna go to Harrisburg together. Just make sure you get out and vote June 2nd for Janet Diaz for Pennsylvania State Senate. Get on my website see all the policies that I am going to fight for because I am passionate I feel you I have cried for you and I will keep fighting for you but we got to do it together so working together for a better Pennsylvania is my goal so this is what I want to reach out and say to you excellent you know this is I'm I'm getting excited here David what what do you want to say because David you, you you're at the front line also uh, trying to recruit Latinos to uh, to get involved in politics and even to run for public office. Um, and you've been the chair of the Latino caucus. And, you know, we didn't have a Latino caucus at the state level. This is something that is new. 
probably within the last four or five years. What is your what what, what is your goal within the next three years? Uh, what do you want to see? What 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 is it that you're trying to accomplish with the Latino Caucus? Well, our goal here in the Latino Caucus is uh, make sure we have proper uh, pro uh, representation that we haven't had in 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 the longest time. Uh, the 20 census uh, or the last census, we were a little bit over 800,000. Uh, the 2020 census, we're going to be the Latinos and Pennsylvania. We're going to be over a million strong. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we still don't have that representation that we should have here in um, Pennsylvania. Not only Lat uh, Latino, but there's also people of color that uh, are we're not represented the, the right way. So I'm going to keep pushing that. I'm going to keep pushing for uh, women. I like women, especially the two women we have here right now, which is Nina and Janet, because they're passionate. They understand their job. A lot of people don't even understand when they want to run, they want to run for position. They don't even understand the position they're, they're running for. And when I hear these women, these ladies talk about the positions, they understand their job. They have a game plan. They already have a, a, everything in order, you know, that, 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 I really like that. That really lights a fire under me to get more, uh, recruit more women just like them. And when it comes to women, I get that. I get that they're uh, more passionate, more, uh, to, to get their, um, hands, um, dirty. They go right in there and, and they shake things up. And I'm, I will continue going around Pennsylvania. Now, what I'm getting to, now, it used to be me reaching out to people. Now I'm having people reaching out to me more and more. I even have um, Anglos up uh, in the mountains calling me about um, how can I help them? Yeah. Good. And, uh, and I'm also reaching out to uh, not only in the mountain, in the rural areas, people are reaching out to me, asking me about how can I help them also? And I, I'm real proud of that. And I will definitely, um, in the upcoming weeks, I'm going to introduce to you more uh, Latinos, uh, especially some females, that uh, I, I'm going to start um, showcasing them. Nina, thank you. Aisha, you have the last word uh, so we can conclude. Well, you know, just again, I want to remind folks that the election is on June the 2nd. Um, it's, it was pushed back from um, April the 28th. And so um, we have a do-over, right? So if you haven't gotten um, a registered to vote, it's very easy to get registered to vote. If you haven't done the mail-in ballot, the mail-in ballot application is very easy. In Philadelphia, it's going to be postage paid, so you don't have to worry about looking for a stamp. Um, so I just want to encourage people to, um, to use their voice, to use their power. I think that folks think that voting is not um, important, but this is your one chance to educate, to, um, uh, to use your power. And, and just going back to what Nina said about this issue of violence and violence along the spectrum, mm -hmm. Malcolm X said something really important, it's the bullet or the ballot. And I don't think that he was talking about, um, you know, a, a revolution. I really think he was talking about, it's your, it's your life that's on the line, right? Mm -hmm. With this COVID-19 and the lack of response that's been happening in communities of color, if you don't vote, then you your voice doesn't matter and you literally are in danger of your community being lost. So it is important to vote, 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 get everybody in your house to vote. I tell people, if you come in my house, if you eat you, and you, you got to vote. So, um, so wow. just come on out and, and, and exercise that power. All right. You're listening to Voices of Change on Uzula Radio. Thank you for participating today. We will see you next Saturday. Nina and Janet, you have a voice here on Voices of Change. We will bring you back before the election. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, David. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.